Hello and welcome back to Financial Accounting. Uh, this week, Chapter 6, Reporting and Analyzing Inventory. In this week, we are going to be discussing, we can click over here, uh, three learning objectives. First, we're going to talk about describing the steps in determining inventory. Then, we're going to look at the effects of inventory errors, so one more qualitative than the next starting to be more identifying. And then the third learning objective we're gonna look at, which is learning objective number six, is applying the FIFO and average cost formulas. So that's two different types of calculation for inventory flow. And we're gonna do that in our learning objective number six as applied to a periodic uh, inventory system. All right, so without further ado, when looking at determining inventory quantities, we want to ensure that at the end of the system, uh, pardon me, at the end of the period, so whether that's at the end of the month, the end of the quarter, the end of the year, we wanna make sure that we do an inventory count. And that is to make sure that what we think we have on our books is equal to what we actually have on our books. Now, if we're doing a, per a perpetual inventory, as we discussed last week, the difference would become uh, shrinkage. And if we aren't doing perpetual, well, this is how we figure out how much we actually used uh, inventory throughout the year. Okay, so the formula is as follows. We already know what we have, quote, on the books, meaning inventory is one of those accounts, it's a balance sheet account. So we, whatever we end up the year last or end the period off last period becomes our opening balance. So then we have our opening balance plus whatever purchases we've made. And then we have our inventory available for sale. Then we do our inventory count and we know what our ending inventory is as far as quantities go. And now we get to determine what our cost, that is our cost of goods sold, that is the difference between our inventory available for sale minus our ending inventory, that's our cost of goods sold. And we have to figure out what is the cost of those prices should be. Because if you think about it, you're likely gonna have a bunch of different costs in there. You're gonna have the costs of your beginning opening inventory plus the purchase price. And so what if last year you got a really good deal on whatever you made or manufactured or purchased? For example, say you have like a, a baseball hat company, you were able to get some inventory really, really cheap. So your opening inventory that was unsold is really, really cheap. But then there was a baseball hat shortage. So you had to go out and purchase some baseball hats at a more expensive cost. You have a bunch of inventory that's available for sale with a bunch of different cost basis. You know, you can also think of this in terms of stocks, right? Um, you know, you buy a bunch of Amazon at one price, you hold on to it. Next year, you buy some more Amazon. What's your cost basis? Um, when you sell, what's your cost basis? So all of this is to figure out what the heck do we, you know, what cost do we attribute to those cost of goods sold and um, how much of our inventory, what price is our ending inventory valued at? So in order to do this, we have two different formulas that will help guide us. And those are first in, first out, otherwise known as FIFO, or average cost. And the way that we choose this formula is to represent the actual physical flow of goods. So let me give you an example. If we are talking about tomatoes, you know, something that uh, inventory that are highly perishable, you know, you definitely want to value this as a first in, first out. Uh, anybody here go to uh, the grocery store and if you're buying like yogurt or anything from the uh, dairy section, do you like go in and then try to pick something from the back of the shelf? Meaning like kind of scooch things over a little bit and grab it from the back. Why do you do that? Well, it's because they tend to put things that are going to be um, come due, uh, that is their best before date. The oldest, sorry, the most recent date, so the things that are gonna expire the most are tend to be up at the front. You know, the most ripe tomatoes tend to be right there, like easy pickings. Uh, and they do that because they want to hold on to preserve their kind of like newer, fresher stuff at the back to give it the best chance to like cycle through. So maximize their sales. So in grocery stores, definitely anything perishable would likely be the best possible physical flow of goods. 
be first in, first out. You know, sell the older oranges, sell the older tomatoes, sell the older dairy first. So if it's first in, it's first out. Then with hats. So if a hat is a hat is a hat, say um, it is a company that does, uh, you know, custom hats. So you get the hats, you get the hat inventory, and then you smack on a decal or something, and then it goes out the door. So if you buy a whole bunch of inventory at a really good price, and then um, other inventory at not such a good price, you know, are you really gonna sell your old hat inventory first if it's all seemingly identical? Probably not. You're like, you're not going out and selecting like the cheaper ones because like, can you even tell which ones they are? Probably not. In that case, it's likely most accurate to use average cost. That is, a hat is a hat is a hat, put them all in a bucket and pull out a hat and the average price is the average price. Okay, so let's look at this in a bit more details. When we look at merchandising inventory, that is our inventory that we purchased uh, to resell, we want to keep an order of operations. Here, I'll pull up Excel a little bit. And say we purchase, let's see, this is our inventory account. Let's do a T account because aren't those kind of fun? Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Um, doo -doo -doo. I think they're fun. Okay, so this is our inventory account. At the beginning of the year, we have, sure, $500 worth of inventory. Um, and they're actually representing... Um, 100 units at $5 per unit. Okay, and that equals our, that equals our beginning inventory of 500. And then throughout the year, we have some purchases. So uh, we're gonna, how many do we purchase? Sure, 50 units at, we're gonna say they're more expensive, right? 60, $6, okay, so then we have six, equals and then this is going to be our purchase of our 300 and you know what we can i was going to keep going for it but let's let's just take a little this is we have available for sale we don't need to do a bunch we can just do two examples we have available for sale we have 150 units and our total cost of those 150 units is going to be our 500 plus our 300. okay so our our units are 800 dollars Okay, available for sale, $800 in there. Cool, cool. So um, under FIFO, if we sell 99 units, the price uh, is going to be at 99 times the $5 because we're gonna say first in, first out. So then we're gonna say, okay, cool. What's left is going to be our 51 units at $300 five dollars so all of this plus one unit from here that's fifo doesn't need to be any more difficult than that so if we sell um 99 units we're gonna put it right here and so we have beginning inventory plus purchases those two together are available for sale this is a, a debit balance increases inventory and then we sold our 99 units, um, and this is gonna be our cost of goods sold of 495. And then our big wonky T account, our way too big T account. Um, our ending inventory is going to be our 500 plus our 300 available for sale, minus our 495 cost of goods sold, 305. Cool, cool, all right. Sure, I'll just put cogs. Okay, and so this is showing one side of each journal entry and to show the flow through for the inventory count. That is FIFO, my friends. All right, so I'm gonna just put a little FIFO. All right, let's go to the slides and let's come back and work our way through this. So now we have average cost. And so average cost is, again, it's used when like you can't really differentiate, there's no like real tactical advantage, like the hat is a hat is a hat. And so now we're trying to figure out, cool, um, what is the average cost for all the inventory at every kind of stage throughout the inventory when we're using perpetual? If we're using periodic, meaning at the end of the year or at the end of the period, month, 
quarter, year, whatever the period is, we just add up all of our purchases, all of our purchases. Imagine instead of 50 units, um, it was five were purchased at six, 10 were purchased at three, blah, 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 blah. We add them all up and we include our average cost of our um, beginning, add them all up, divide them by the number of units that gives our average cost. And um, yeah, we just, whether it's one big average cost at the end for periodic or little mini average costs um, whenever you purchase a new um, batch of inventory, that's the difference between perpetual and periodic. Otherwise, uh, the math still maths. So let's look at the math for um, our average cost. Okay, so this is our math for our FIFO. Let's be a little lazy and see what the difference is. You say lazy, I say efficient. Okay, we know that that number is not gonna be that number, but we know that this number is, because our purchases are still our purchases, our opening inventory is still our opening inventory. It's this math that's gonna change. Okay, so we're gonna call this average cost because it's average cost. Okay, so that's not gonna be ending inventory anymore. I'll put a little E there, just, Samantha, why is your E there, not here? Well, because there's numbers in there. Okay, let this go over. Okay, so we have our math here is going to be, we have our purchases, we have our 150 units, and we have our $800. That's what our price is, 800, 150 units. So then our average cost, you're gonna be like, is this university math? No, this is university accounting math. <laughs> All right, oh, accounting has so much math, sure. Okay, uh, <laughs> this equals our $800 uh, divided by 150 units, 150 units equals $5.33.33 per unit, cool. All right, so the same thing, uh, we sold 99 units. So 99 times by, here we go. And we have $528 for our cost of goods sold. Cool, all right, same thing. We have 500 opening plus 300 purchasing less 528 cost of goods sold. And this gives us ending inventory of $272 under average cost. Cool. All right, so again, the policy choice is based off of what is your type of inventory, which flow of goods, you better sell the first stuff first. Is it tomatoes, perishables, is there a reason for this? Or is it average cost, a hat is a hat is a hat. Alrighty, let us return to the slides. So at the end of all of this, after you figured out what your ending inventory number is, then we have this kind of overall rule to check for impairment. And that is, does the number of your ending inventory, is that, I always, okay, I want to, such a, it's such a, like a, a quote, like such a bankable, like buzzword quote, it's lower of cost or net realizable value. So your inventory balance at the end of the year, it must be at the lower of cost, cost or net realizable value. And all net realizable value or NRV means is what can you sell it for? What can you sell it for? What can you sell it for? So for example, if you have these hats and um, the total, the total amount of, you know, somebody comes by, um, say you're, I don't know, you, you get this inventory valuation specialist to come out uh, and they say, hey, cool, your inventory is only worth $300. Well, if you're using average cost, you are you would have an impairment, or pardon me, sorry. Ah. Um, if you were using FIFO, you would have an impairment because it needs to be at the lower of cost or net realizable value well, if it's worth 300 and this is 305, you have to impair this by $5.
And if you're using average cost, then you don't have an impairment because inventory has to be at the lower of cost or net realizable value. And cost 272 is gonna be lower than net realizable value of 300. So other ways that you can check for this is because accounting, you know, we report on things that already happened. So after year end, we find out that, you know, instead of having an inventory specialist to come in, more likely, more practically, is two or three months later, we figure out that this ending inventory ends up selling for $300 um, and that the sales relating to this ending inventory relates to $300. And so then at the kind of when you do your true up entries, your top side entries, your adjusting entries for the year end, um, then that's when you would have to make this adjustment. And or if you miss it, your auditors will likely catch this and say, listen, um, your inventory is overvalued at your end. You ended up only realizing $300 off of this. So you need to impair this down. Um, either way, this would be impaired down to 300. This we would do nothing because it's lower than cost or net realizable value. But Samantha, can't you write it up? No. The thing is, and I don't want to use the word conservative because that is not an IFRS term. However, the economic reality as at year end is that this will eventually turn into $300 worth of sales. And the standard says lower of cost or net realizable value. Cool. This is lower. This will eventually turn into $300. So lower of cost or net realizable value. Well, that needs to be 300. So the economic reality is, is that you have one that is more expensive than the other one that is, um, you know, appropriate given the standard. But Samantha, <laughs> um, you know, why is that? It's just the same. It's just, you know, the same numbers, but different way of accounting for it. Well, it's because in a sense, maybe this FIFO didn't accurately capture the flow of goods. We thought it did, but maybe it didn't. Or maybe something happened after year end because essentially they expensed way more cost of goods sold and therefore had less costs in their ending inventory, whereas they didn't expense as many cost of goods sold um, and therefore will need a small impairment. So at the end of the day, your costs in are gonna equal your costs out. Like it's just what happens, right? Regardless of whatever, you know, you give this a long enough runway, these are going to be equal. But in the short term, there's going to be timing differences. There's going to be fluctuations. There could be impairment differences. Uh, and that is why policy is important. Uh, I manage, uh, I contribute to policy for a number of different uh, accounting education uh, programs. Um, accounting policy is exciting. Policy on education is exciting. Policy it's, um, and, and, and you know, trust me, when I hear the word policy, I don't necessarily get excited, but when I think about incentives, when I think about motivation, when I think about accuracy, when I think about uh, the kind of downstream effects that this has, it does get rather exciting. And if you think about this from a manager's point of view, a manager would much rather have a lower cost of goods sold because then that would mean that your, you know, versus a higher, because your bonus would be bigger, because you would have less expenses, therefore a higher net income. However, if you then had an impairment on your books, essentially then you might be signaling to your shareholders, <laughs> yet, yet you can't manage your business. So anyways, there's lots of things that these financial statements communicate that have you know, big impacts to both managers and executives um, personally and professionally, and also indications to the uh, capital markets, which then can affect your share price. So again, uh, that's that's where this stuff jazzes me up, gets me pretty excited. Okay, back to here. We're gonna show one more visual of what we just discussed. So if we do happen to do um, a write down because there was an impairment to lower of cost or net realizable value, if, and so we reduce, um, Pardon me, when we do the impairment, we do it the same as through cost of goods sold, right? So if we're just, we follow this up here, um, then our impairment would be $5. It would be called impairment, may, uh, likely flow through cost of goods sold, may may not have to disclose that in the notes. And then our ending here would be 300. And then we would have nothing over here. And then, if subsequently 
you know, uh, under the first method where the valuator came in and said, hey, your stuff's only worth 300. If we subsequently, um, the next valuator came in, say we didn't sell any hats for, I don't know, six months, and they came in and were like, whoa, it's actually worth like, whatever, 600. Then we can um, write it back up. Uh, or we can reverse the um, we can reverse that write down, but we can't like write it up beyond like beyond what the reversal was. People like in practice, this doesn't happen a lot because like you're churning through. Like your business isn't meant to hold inventory. Um, holding inventory actually costs you money, and so you know this typically doesn't happen too too much. However, it is. A possibility it is available within our rules so it may or may not happen all right time for a question a company just starting business made inventory purchases in August at a time when prices were rising the inventory cost formula that would produce the higher gross profit for August is take a pause read the answers and let me know what you think in just a minute talk soon all right if you said not determinable, you are wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Um, and if you said C, FIFO, you are right. So if the prices are rising, that means that the inventory that you purchased earlier is going to be cheaper than the stuff that you uh, purchased later. Therefore, FIFO will give you the lower cost of goods sold that for the lower expenses, because cost of goods sold is expense, therefore the higher gross profit. All right, how'd you do? Uh, thank you so much for your effort. I will see you in the next video.